Hello. So, the Copernican principle states that uh, we don't occupy any sort of special position in the universe. We are uh, entirely average. This has been a guiding principle in science for centuries. It's, uh, it's taken us from a worldview where we occupy the most important place, the center, uh, to a worldview where the sun is actually at the center of the universe and we are just one of several planets orbiting the sun. Uh, to the modern view that the sun is itself just one of hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way, and the Milky Way is itself just one of hundreds of billions of galaxies in our observable universe. Uh, I think the trend is fairly clear. <laughs> and I think we can make progress a lot more quickly if we just admit to ourselves that this trend is very likely to continue. So it's time to discard the Copernican principle, as helpful as it's been, uh, in favor of something a little bit stronger. Hence, the strong Copernican principle, the idea that we are not even average. <laughs> we are, in fact, terrible. Now, the strong Copernican principle is a profound new insight into our true place in the universe. And we can take advantage of this to tackle some of the biggest outstanding problems today, not only in astrophysics, but in science as a whole. Uh, so let's start with a puzzle that has stumped astrophysicists for years, and that has come up at least once earlier tonight already, uh, dark matter. Dark matter is 80% of all of the matter in the universe, and we still don't know what it is or why we can't see it. But instead of asking why we can't see it, let's rephrase the question in a more suggestive manner. Why is dark matter hiding? <laughs> Here, the strong Copernican principle really suggests a very simple solution. We are terrible. And perhaps dark matter does not want to be seen by us. Indeed, compared to us, dark matter is pretty awesome. It has a variety of superpowers that we could only dream of. Uh, first of all, dark matter is entirely invisible, uh, both to visible light and all forms of electromagnetic radiation. This is something that we're still struggling to achieve under controlled lab conditions. Dark matter can do it with its eyes closed. Uh, not only is it invisible, though, it, it can also actually pass right through normal matter. So this is actually a, a classic superpower that we associate with real comic book heroes. Dark matter can do it and probably is doing it right now. There's probably dark matter passing through this theater as we speak. And more generally, dark matter, and maybe this is the most impressive capability of dark matter, dark matter just doesn't have to deal with all of the crap that the universe throws at us on a regular basis, you know, from uh, asteroid impacts to uh, supernovae to, you know, a random sexist asshole on the street who's just hurling racial epithets at people. <laughs> dark matter just doesn't give a shit about any of that. Uh, so clearly, dark matter is awesome, while we are... not exactly awesome. We're pretty terrible. So it's no wonder that we can't see dark matter. Dark matter doesn't want to be seen anywhere near us. Uh, and this leads us to our first empirical prediction from the strong Copernican principle. All efforts to directly detect dark matter, no matter how assiduous, will fail. And indeed, if we take a look at the history of dark matter direct detection efforts, they've all failed. Uh, this is a triumph for the strong Copernican principle. <laughs> so now that we've handily disposed of dark matter, let's move on to an even deeper problem one that lies at the very heart of physics, nay, all of science itself. Uh, the problem of the arrow of time. Uh, the, the question here is that time clearly has a preferred direction. We notice that there's a difference between the past and the future, but the fundamental laws of physics are undirected in time. So it's not clear why the arrow of time points one way rather than the other way. The usual solution here is to blame this on thermodynamics. Entropy increases going into the future. But the strong Copernican principle suggests that this is itself a result of something deeper. 
the arrow of time is simply a result of things just getting worse as time goes on. This is very easy to see in our everyday lives. What happens when time goes forward? Mostly bad things. You trip on a rock and break your leg. Your pet rabbit dies. And then your wife leaves you. <laughs> but going back in time, this unyielding series of irrevocable mistakes is reversed. The rock leaps up and hopefully mends your leg. Mr. Hoppy comes back to life just when you need him most. And your wife returns for some reason. And best of all, eventually even the mistake of your own birth is rectified and you enter the sweet embrace of preemptive oblivion. <laughs> Finally, let's consider a problem that all of us wonder about. The Fermi Paradox. Where are all of the aliens? Now, the strong Copernican principle immediately suggests a simple solution. <laughs> aliens are deliberately avoiding us because we're terrible. This, this is actually an old idea in the scientific literature. It was first proposed decades ago. It's referred to as the zoo hypothesis. Uh, but a little thinking shows that this can't actually be right. If Earth were a zoo, it would be better organized and we would be better trained. <laughs> and uh, the zookeepers certainly wouldn't allow the unequal distribution of food and other resources that we have in the world today. It would be not only unethical, but terrible for business. Uh, clearly, something else must be going on. And the strong Copernican principle does suggest a uh, deeper way to resolve this problem. We know that we occupy an unusually terrible place in the universe, and there is life here. So perhaps life itself is terrible. <laughs> we haven't met any aliens because we are unusually unfortunate to exist at all. This is clearly a more plausible solution. Indeed, the idea that life is terrible has a deep and rich history in the literature. It has been considered seriously by many great thinkers throughout history. Uh, it's not... <laughs> it's nice to know that physics can finally provide a definitive answer to the question of whether life is terrible. Uh, in conclusion, let's reflect on our newfound knowledge. Just as with the original Copernican principle, the strong Copernican principle gives us a new perspective on our place in the cosmos. <laughs> Einstein once said that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. We now know that he was wrong. <laughs> we are way, way too terrible to ever understand how terrible we really are but we can certainly rest assured in our knowledge that we are not merely insignificant, but inferior. <laughs> I'd like to thank my friends and family, along with literally everyone else I've ever met or even heard of, for directly inspiring the central thesis of this work. <laughs> Adam, Adam, are you okay? Yeah, man. <laughs> hey, do you wanna you wanna talk after this? Or are you you good? Yeah, I'm I'm fine. I'm yeah. Fine. <laughs> uh, Adam, under under this principle, um, do you expect that there's anything worse than us that science might help us discover so we can possibly mock it, or? <laughs> Does our badness expand asymptotically as our knowledge grows? Well, so this is an intriguing possibility, and I'm really glad that you brought this up. It's entirely possible that there is some poor, benighted, I don't know, baryon somewhere in the universe that's somehow worse than we are. But um, 
you said that science could help us find this, but you forget that science is a product of human enterprise, and we are terrible. So even if there is something even worse than we are, our own awfulness precludes our own ability to find this. Uh, indeed, it's difficult to even conceive of anything worse than we are. I, I think my uh, fellow judge was only bringing up the uh, Limp Biscuit corollary. Bringing up the what? It's a, it's a, it's a 90s thing, don't worry about it. I, I have... <laughs> you kids, um, you, you kids and your music. I have a tangential question. Uh, you, you said um, that dark matter hides from us because we're terrible. Um, do cats also do that? <laughs> Just curious. I think that if you've ever spent time with a cat and you really search your soul, you'll know the answer to that question. Confirmed! How can we become better? Mary, are you okay? <laughs> I'm really sad. <laughs> this is depressing. Surely there's a quantum answer. Hmm. Um, well, uh, going back to one of my previous slides, um, let's see here. Right. This slide suggests that if, uh, if somehow we were to find a way to go back in time, <laughs> we could become better. Um, I believe there was a, part, a, a paper by uh, McFly et al. that uh, expanded... <laughs> That expanded on this possibility, uh, but as of yet, this is still theoretical work. Is there any possibility that the strong Copernican principle only applies to physicists? <laughs> now we're pretty awesome. Please join me in giving a big hand for Adam Becker.